Hello and welcome back to our fourth session, um, one of the most exciting times of the day. We're going to have our panel debate later, so uh, I hope you're still going to be around for that. Hope you had some coffee, maybe did some yoga, enjoyed yourself, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, welcoming Ferdinand Chung, uh, who is a, a, an associate professor at the Karolinska Institute, but also the co-founder of EBBA Biotech. And um, I give you the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And first and foremost, I'd like to thank um, Life Science Sweden uh, and Medeon uh, for the chance to speak here today. I'm representing um, two of the uh, two very interesting organizations, and you'll hear a bit about them um, as we come along. So to begin with, um, we are relevant here today because uh, of specifically the things we do. Um, we deal in close association with the laboratory as well as techniques for diagnostics. And the two organizations I represent are EBBA Biotech, as well as AIMS, the Center for, Advanced, um, that for the Advancement of Integrated Medical Sciences and Engineering. Um, and this is a, a joint center between um, Karolinska and KTH. EBBA Biotech itself um, deals very nicely, specifically with the um, development of tools, the tools for laboratory scientists, as well as um, diagnosticians within clinical laboratories, to detect diseases that they might be interested in. AIMS deals in developing tools in the academic sense. We validate them, we create new ones, we test them out on a wide variety of settings, and then we try to bring them further into universally usable tools that then can be provided to the greater research community by organizations such as EBBA Biotech. And so today, EBBA Biotech is a member of Medeon, and um, I also have to say that Medeon has provided and understood a lot of the things that EBBA Biotech does and has given us the opportunity to really grow um, as a provider of services and tools um, for the greater research community. So um, EBBA Biotech is um, founded in Sweden, and here, here is our founder, Agneta richter Dalfosch. She's both um, a professor at KTH and KI, as well as our CEO. Um, it's founded on a very simple idea that we as researchers, knowing the failings we have and knowing the tools that we need, um, we could possibly be in the best position to create something that would improve research as a whole. And that simple idea has taken us quite far now into what we are now, where we provide a lot of different things um, to researchers across the world. The technology itself is known as optotracing. It's fairly simple. It's a single molecule that is very adaptive to different situations that we toss at it. So as an example, when we're looking at carbohydrate application, so here is a potato. When the molecule is added onto a piece of potato, it interacts with different molecules present. And with potato, the most abundant two components is cellulose and starch. So in this example, the molecule binds to starch and changes its um, geometry. And that then creates a situation where it fluoresces in green. At the same time, when this molecule binds to cellulose, it adopts a completely different geometry. And that then gives us a yellow coloration. And so the basic idea here is with one molecule, without very much damaging the sample, we can look and identify all the different components of the materials that is present. One of our principles is that technology should be transferable across different disciplines. So in the same way that we're looking at materials in plants, we should also be able to look at different materials, or in this case, pathogen-associated molecular patterns that happens in a disease. The technology at Abba Biotech is offered in four different product lines. The first is known as Emi Tracker, and this is used to detect amyloid fibers or disease-associated protein aggregates within such diseases. The second line is Carbotrace, where we think of a more um, circular bioeconomy type of application, where we figure out what materials are composed of and how they change when we try to um, use them and see if we can develop better and more efficient processes. The third is EBBA Biolite, and this has to do very specifically with infection biology. Here, the molecules are used to detect a lifestyle known as biofilm, which is then important in diseases. And this I will talk a little bit more about. 
So again, MB tracker binds to amyloid or disease-associated uh, protein aggregates. Carbotrace binds to different carbohydrate materials within a plant sample. And EBA biolite binds to components or materials within a biofilm for the purpose of being able to say it's a biofilm and therefore study diseases a lot better. And here are some general advantages. Important to a researcher today, the molecule and the technology being stable and non-toxic is very relevant. Think back upon 50, 100 years ago, researchers, we existed, but we were using very different type of chemicals. We know now that some of these chemicals are extremely toxic, and that has changed our lives considerably. The fact that these molecules avoid this problem then allows us as researchers to be much more creative and flexible in the experiments that we design, and that in turn helps uh, diagnostics improve in leaps and bounds. Today, this product, our technology, has been supporting research in diseases across a lot of different fields associated with healthcare, and it has also been supporting researchers in a lot of different countries around the world. Now, briefly, I will look into, I will talk about one application of this technology, and this relates to the second organization that I'm representing today. Um, this is Ames. We are located at KI, and we are a joint center between KI and KTH. Here, optotracing, the technology, is being applied into improving the research and diagnostics of infections. Specifically, we are looking at bacterial infections. What we believe is that bacteria infections are very... Um, that we are not looking at them in the right way. Bacteria infections are common to everybody's um, lives. You can have this, your neighbor can have this, you could have one at the moment, but very often they do not provide symptoms, and when they do, we want to treat them. But what happens when we can no longer treat these infections that follow us through our lifetime? Specifically, I'm referring to persistent and resistant infections. Infections that resist the treatments that we apply to them, persistent infections, and sorry, resistant infections, and the ones that even though we treat them seem to come back over and over again, persistent infections. What we believe is that biofilms might be the key reason that these type of infections exist. A biofilm is like the house that the bacteria lives in. So when you do find bacteria and you have the chance to look them, at them under the microscope, they don't exist as little individual bacteria swimming around. They do if you live in the deep sea, as a recent study showed, but for most parts, bacteria live within a biofilm. And that is logical, because the environment surrounding us, as well as bacteria, are very harsh. So naturally, Bacteria need to produce some sort of protection to resist all these environmental factors and survive. Naturally, these structures that bacteria produce and the biofilm as a whole is effective in resisting the treatments that we apply to it, as well as our efforts to clean them away from surfaces to keep things sterile. When looking at infections, and specifically biofilms, there are a couple of very simple techniques that are being used extensively in the field now. We do acknowledge as biofilm researchers that some of these techniques are extremely flawed, that they're lacking, but these are the tools we have at the moment. This is one of the focuses of AIMS and Abba Biotech, and that is to improve the ways that we can detect bacteria and biofilms in that case. The information and the data I will show today relates very specifically to the Congoret agar assay, and this is because this is a very um, common method used to detect biofilms and has several important failings that we would like to bring um, across today. So the method is very simple. You have a dye. You put this dye in a growth media. Bacteria grow on the growth media. They produce structures. As these structures are formed, the dye incorporates into the biofilm and produces a red, a dry, a rough uh, phenotype. And depending on the combination of these features, we can then say if a biofilm is present or if um, the biofilm is composed of specific materials such as cellulose or amyloid fibers. The problem with this is that it's like art. You need to have a trained eye to look at this. So when you've done this for, say, 10, 20, 30 years, you're great at it. 
But when you want to retire or when you're really tired of looking at these small little red colonies and you move on to a different job, the person replacing you is going to have a really hard time in diagnosing these um, colonies as a biofilm or not. And here is what we are trying to improve. Our technology, when placed in a growth media, seems to interact very specifically with the amyloid component of the biofilm. So by looking at the presence or absence of these amyloid components, here shown in red, we can then say, is this, a this um, category of biofilms presence or not? So this becomes a much easier essay, where the answer is a yes, no, or instead of maybe because today I had a good day. Um, in this specific case, we were looking at Salmonella enteritidis, a common foodborne pathogen. We saw that specific genotypes of this bacteria formed a very nice biofilm with very clear structures, and the absence of which causes very different morphologies. Here, we're still looking at a very visual characteristic of the biofilm shown by our technology, but just by a cursory look at if red is present or not, anybody can diagnose if this is a biofilm or not. And in doing so, we tried to really um, apply this method in automation and, high, and in, in increasing the throughput. The idea is that if we could make something that is independent of the person, so all the technician has to do is look at a whole table of yes-no answers as he, he or she looks at the multitude of strains they look every day, um, maybe we could improve it. So we developed a very simple um, workflow where there is minimum involvement of the person. We were able to look through some of our collaborations at a large number of urine samples, so biofilms in a liquid environment. And in these 128 strains, we were very rapidly able to see if a biofilm was present or not. In this case, this was in relation to cellulose, one of the two major components of a uropathogenic E. coli biofilm. On the other hand, we were through the clean care project that's uh, led and organized by RISE. Um, we were able to look at biofilms present within surfaces within a hospital ward. And the idea is that interactions with these surfaces, depending on who walks by every day, infections can be spread. And if a biofilm is present, we are spreading a biofilm which has the property of being resistant and the potential to be a persistent infection. In this case, we looked at 300 strains, and we were again very quickly able to see if a amyloid or a curli-type biofilm was present or not. And here is the academic value of the data. By looking at the extracellular matrix structures on the right, we, were, we, we very quickly spotted this um, very strong and thick wall-like structures. We know that these forms from the buckling of the biofilm as it forms, but what is more important is that when we try to flood this biofilm with particles to see what is accessible to water, there were very clear areas where nothing went in. So if we extend this understanding to the diffusion of antibiotics, we would then see these radio projecting structures as places where the bacteria would protect itself whenever treatment is present. And that is at the macroscopic level. In the microscopic level, we find that the assembly of these structures was not uniform, so it wasn't everywhere. There were pockets where these structures were present and pockets where it was without. So even at the microscopic level, the protection that the biofilm gives to the, to the bacterial colony is not uniform. So again, thinking back on antibiotics, some bacteria will survive when we try to treat it, no matter how hard we try. Um, here is something that we developed using this technique. For us, it was very important to know how things develop in real time because we wanted to know maybe if there was a, a timing in its lifestyle where we could halt it and treat it when it's not a biofilm. And here we see that as a bacteria comes in contact with, the, with a um, growth surface, the colony expands gradually outwards in all directions. And as the planktonic bacteria colonize the surface, that then expands into a larger colony. And when that colony reaches a specific maturity, the biofilm or the extracellular matrix starts to form. So the protective structures start to appear. We notice that every spot always starts off with planktonic 
or exponentially growing bacteria. And this is important because in antibiotic development, the assay itself focuses very strongly on planktonic bacteria. So this would mean that if we were to apply antibiotics to such a growing colony, the leading edge or the bacteria on the outside would be very well treated and effectively treated by the antibiotic. But more importantly, the inner reaches where the extracellular matrix has formed, it's likely that these areas will resist treatment. And so we have to do something about them that we would otherwise not do when we come to planktonic bacteria. We see that the biofilm lifestyle was not unique to the lab. So this was not something very artificial. When we looked at a model of wound dressing, we see that within the contact surface where a bandage meets the skin in our model, we see that these pores that normally allow water to channel away from the wound are actually are providing an environment where the biofilm then forms. In this case, the structures might not be projecting radially, but more vertically from the wound and away into the absorptive layers of a typical bandage. And as we start to look at how these structures form in real time, we can then look at how we can treat them in real time too. So here is more recent work where we tried an antibiotic against the biofilm. Here, I'm referring to the Kirby disk diffusion test for those that know about it. And we see that when a biofilm that has ready formed for 24 hours encounters an antibiotic on the side, diffusion of the antibiotic from the disk rapidly meets the growing biofilm. The green fluorescence, which indicates bacteria, rapidly recedes, suggesting that bacteria is being killed. But the red extracellular matrix structures remain. And if you were to look very closely in your screen right now, you will see that right beside these red structures are still little remnants of green. So this would then suggest that bacteria are surviving, probably in these specialized regions where diffusion is harder. So these are possible things that our technology can aid when it comes to diagnosis of biofilms. Now, as part of an EU as an EU organization, sustainability is very important to us. And I'd like to highlight how a lot of our technology is about improving um, or hitting the sustainable development goals. Very obviously, since we are dealing with the diagnostics of infections, we are very focused on, on improving the good um, health and well-being of um, everybody in the world. At the same time, when we then reapply the technology into looking at foodborne pathogens, about how bacteria cause food to be spoiled or food that would otherwise have been edible that now need to be disposed, we improve on reducing um, global hunger. When we then reapply the technology into looking at biofilms in water systems, we are focusing on maintaining clean water and sanitation for our cities. Um, Coming back to how a stable molecule that's easy to work with and is non-toxic can improve a researcher's life, we are looking at how we can then have reduced impact on the environment, um, thinking about how a lot of molecules do get um, released into the environment and then has a negative impact on the ecosystem. Um, here are our teams and our people. Again, I'm representing EBA Biotech as well as Ames, and these are some of the key people that have been involved in the project here. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Ferdinand. Um, and also thank you so much for Median to be our partner today. Um, one of my uh, questions was about how um, uh, futuristic is it to think that we'll have uh, these at home? I'm thinking like, you know, chicken and salmonella. How is it possible that we can have this in the home setting, that we can actually test our services and is our uh, chicken, you know, going to give us mm. salmonella, et cetera? Especially if you've got young children around, you know, our services, mm. hiding bacteria that can potentially make you ill, and especially with, obviously, the COVID situation in the last mm. 12 months. Mm. Is that something that you see that is... And is it affordable as well? Well, I think we would see that in the near future. We've been um, trying very hard to get something that... Uh, well, we try to work our, our projects in a realistic sense, something mm -hmm. that can be used by anybody every day. Um, and in, in relation to your question, um, the technology or the experiment itself existed a couple of years ago. We took a summer, we brought in some chicken, we spoiled it and it stank up the whole lab. <laughs> Meantime, we were able to detect the biofilm. So the technology is sound okay. and it would work. 
And is that is there a, um, an international cleaning company interested in this so that they can, you know, who is going to come to you or, you know, take the idea and actually make it into a reality of a consumer, really? Well, there are companies now that, that deal in, in the cleaning of biofilms. One of them is RealCo. Mm -hmm. um, they use dyes that stain a lot of different type of microbial colonies. Right. And, and what we think we can improve on is a specific detection because Detection by visible dyes is about mass. Mm. And what we know about bacteria is if you leave one on the desk, it's going to grow into a suitable mass given the amount of time. So it, with our technology, we envision that we can clean them off before they ever become a problem, no matter how little they are. Fantastic. It's almost like science f fiction, really, isn't it? Well, that's life science. That's every day for <laughs> us. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, Pedernat. Mm. Now, you're obviously staying for the panel as yes. well, which is great. Yes, so I'll great. see you later again. You will? Yeah. Okay.